Hi listeners, Jason here. This is a special Out of Sync Expert Series episode from a recorded webinar where Joelle and I discuss an all new leader training program commencing the 5th of December. Workplace mental health training for leaders has predominantly focused on teaching them to recognize the signs of mental ill health and then how to escalate to care. Rather than waiting for employees to become unwell, leaders can play an active part in preventing ill health and promoting well-being through better work design. Whereas organizational level systemic interventions can be challenging and time consuming to accomplish, leaders can respond dynamically to the changing psychosocial hazards in their teams to reduce demands or increase resources. This requires more than just awareness raising. It requires skill building. Listen along to this special episode and check it out in the link in the show notes if you'd like to find out more. Now, on to this episode. From Flourish DX, this is the Psych Health and Safety Podcast. With workplace mental health becoming a safety prerogative, this is the source of information on psychological injury prevention and health promotion. All right, so in terms of the, um, the, the why, um, we know that mental health is a real focus, um, particularly here in Australia where we do have regulatory reform um, going on. And the reason we've got regulatory reform to really elevate psychological health and safety to the same level as physical health and safety is that we're not doing well when it comes to creating mentally healthy work where people aren't harmed. Um, and probably most damning uh, for this is looking at workers' compensation statistics. Um, so in Australia, we just actually had the latest um, released from uh, Safe Work Australia just in the last couple of weeks. And what we're seeing is that whilst the total number of claims is down, so year on year, uh, we're actually now at 11,700 claims in the most recent reporting period, um, compared to over 12,000 in the, the previous reporting period. Um, overall, uh, what we're looking at is um, something that's up 69% over the last seven years. So it's still, the trend is the wrong way. But it's not just a total amount of claims. What we're looking at is an increase in complexity and cost of claims as well. So now um, the, the latest median amount of time that people are taking off when they do make a mental injury claim is 34.2 weeks. Um, now, if we take out um, the mental health conditions from all the other claims and just look at all the other claims on their own, it's 5.4 weeks is the median claim for everything else. So we're talking about something that generally results in a claim that is six to seven uh, times longer off work when it actually happens. And so therefore the cost is obviously a lot greater as well, about four to five, five times greater than the uh, the median for all other claims. So we're seeing something that's trending in the wrong way. Um, uh, I mean, this, this is up significantly um, over time, so 69% over the last seven years. But if you build in the complexity, then you actually really understand how big an issue it is and, and what the um, uh, what the escalation actually looks like. So one thing I did um, just recently, and I haven't seen anyone else really report on this widely yet, is look at, well, then, what is the amount of time that we are losing due to mental injuries and how does that relate to all other claims? So you can see here, if we look at mental injury claims on their own, 9.2% um, of total claims out of the whole pie, so less than 10% of all serious claims uh, are due to mental injuries. But they account for almost 40% of all the time lost due to any illness or injury claim, uh, which is huge, right? Now, this is actually up 304% over the last seven years because we're just seeing that, that continual escalation in how complex these claims are. So whatever it is we're doing in workplace mental health, because you'd have to agree in Australia, particularly over the last decade, there has been a lot of work done and a lot of investment into you know, mental health solutions, training, um, EAPs, all this sort of stuff. Whatever it is that we're doing is clearly not working because we're just seeing more and more claims and people are taking um, increasingly longer periods of time off work. And, you know, um, obviously the, the rates of return to work are, are pretty dismal at the moment as well. So what's really trying to get um, people to change their thinking around this um, is the, regula the regulation changes that we're seeing in Australia. So now as of um, this month, we know that South Australia and ACT will be joining um, most of the rest of Australia, or at least the, the states that are under the harmonised legislation, to uh, have the regulations in force. Uh, Victoria, <laughs> for those who keep asking, uh, we still don't have a time frame on when they, their regulations are going to be in force. Um, you'd have to guess, so it'd probably be somewhere in the next three to six months. Um, but really what these regulations are asking companies to do is to take a risk management lens 
to looking at what is within our control to prevent people from getting harmed. So how can we prevent mental injuries applying the same approach to what we do with trying to eliminate um, uh, physical hazards and reduce the risk of physical hazards causing physical harm to people? Um, and we know that has been effective. Um, you know, over the last 20 years, we've seen a, a, a very a steady uh, decline in fatalities and um, and incidents as well happening in the physical space. But it's the reverse for, for mental health, and that just seems to be um, uh, escalating at the moment. So I guess, you know, whatever we're doing in, in, in relation to workplace mental health is simply not good enough. We need to do better. Um, and what we're being asked to do uh, by regulations is to consider the role of work. How do we create better work that doesn't harm people? And that while we're at it, we know we can craft work that is actually good for people's well-being and will drive engagement and productivity as well. Um, now, there has been a call uh, as recently as this year um, through um, an article by some of the preeminent researchers in work design, so Backer and Demetrio, um, looking at how job demands and resources can be applied. And they've even called out, hey, one of the opportunities for improvement in this space is leader training. Um, can we actually, rather than just health and safety or HR, understanding about jobs and demands and, and resources, how to craft um, mentally healthy work, can we equip leaders to be able to do this? And it makes sense to do that, right? Because if we think about it, we want um, that trickle-down effect. Most companies that we're looking at uh, at the moment who are doing psychological health and safety, it's very much something that uh, is being done at a, more of a global level. Hey, let's get HR or health and safety to you know, maybe do a global risk assessment, understand what are the hazards uh, and risks within the organisation. And then we're going to craft controls that are really at a high level. You know, It might be policy level controls. It might be you know, um, it, it might be updating risk registers, that sort of thing. But what we, we need and um, what's actually going to make this work is actually getting leaders uh, involved because the leaders are the ones who can see on the ground the experience of frontline workers and be able to respond more dynamically as new hazards um, emerge and, and to be able to respond to those. So um, definitely this is a, something that was uh, identified in research as, as recently as this year as something that's not occurring and is uh, definitely an opportunity for improvement. So as we started to think about what would a, and we're going to talk in, in detail about what our leader training actually looks like, um, but as we started to think about, okay, well, if we need leaders to be involved in this to actually make uh, mentally healthy work um, and be more dynamic to the needs of their uh, specific teams, what are the key considerations that we need to, to keep in mind? And one of them, as we saw in the poll, is that there, there does seem to be a, a, a really big focus when we are doing training, um, whether that's for all employees or for leaders, to really focus on mental illness um, rather than uh, focusing on, hey, what's within the control of the leader to actually influence the mental health of, of their workers. And that's actually by designing better work rather than you know, just being able to listen to people and then escalate to the EAP uh, if required. So um, we figured there's actually heaps of training already around mental uh, health, mental ill health, even things like positive psychology and resilience. Um, there isn't so much training uh, available to, first of all, look at psychosocial factors. It's good to see again from the poll that some people are doing some of that awareness raising, but the skills building, how are we actually giving leaders the skills to consult with workers and craft better work on the fly. And so what we're really seeing, if we think about the hierarchy of controls, is that there does seem to be a real focus uh, historically on changing the worker rather than changing the work. Um, so this is something I've come up with uh, recently, thinking about the hierarchy of controls, the traditional hierarchy of controls that's usually applied to physical health and safety, you can see in the top right, and it's supposed to be an upside down triangle. Um, where we have elimination at the top, we know these are the most effective things that we can do, right? So if we have something like um, a trip hazard, we know rather than putting a sign up uh, saying, watch your, watch your step, um, which is an example of an administrative control, we know actually removing the trip hazard altogether is actually going to be more likely to remove the, the likelihood that someone is actually going to be injured due to that hazard. And in the same way, we can apply elimination strategies to psychosocial hazards. Um, Probably uh, where you have people involved, uh, impossible to eliminate all psychosocial hazards. But if you focus your efforts on specific ones, like say role ambiguity, it is possible to implement elimination strategies. So for instance, 
Uh, if we have role ambiguity, if we have good job descriptions that are reviewed regularly, uh, if we have employees having regular discussions with their leaders around, hey, what are the priorities and how is my role maybe evolving? Um, what, what that can do is actually eliminate that role ambiguity and people can be very clear about what their job is, what their responsibilities are and how they're going to be successful in their role. Um, but not all psychosocial hazards are able to be eliminated, like work overload, for example. We know in certain occupations, there's always going to be peaks and troughs of work overload and they're not going to be eliminated. So what are we going to do to redesign the work? So can we, for example, um, you know, look at removing some hindrance demands? So if we've got excessive meetings or if we've um, got some bureaucracy or technology involved that's making our job more difficult, is there a way to smooth those things out in order to redesign the work and make the workload less oppressive? So work redesign is something that can be done. And, you know, there's been research going into what does good work look like and how do we design work using things like job demands and resources and self-determination theory and, and these sorts of things, you know, decades worth of research. Um, however, it's not the first thing we think of with, with mental health. Generally, we're going more towards the bottom. So uh, I'd imagine everyone on this call, um, if you're working in a, 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 an organisation with more than, say, 20, 30 people, you've got an EAP available. Uh, and that's obviously about how do we provide reactive support to individual workers as they need it. Um, other workers um, might be provided training. Again, it might be lunch and learns around mental ill health. It might be around things like mental health first aid. They might even be given, um, you know, access to uh, online portals where there's wellness information, um, might even be an app around mindfulness or resilience as well. So there's a, a real focus on that, less of a focus on the things that we know from a physical health and safety perspective are more effective, and that's about changing the work rather than um, trying to change the worker. So again, that's weighing on our minds as we think about this leader training. How do we actually get more people to be doing work design? And this can't just be something that is owned by health and safety and HR. We need leaders to understand what does good work design look like and how can they actually craft better work for the people in their care, not just to prevent psychological injuries, but also to promote those conditions for thriving and high levels of engagement and productivity as well. Um, as I mentioned uh, at the outset, you know, most organisations are very early stages with psychosocial risk management and it's typically only updating global level controls. So one of the ways they do that is by updating their risk register, going, hey, look, we know that it might just be one line item saying psychosocial factors, for example, and they'll go, oh, look, look at all the controls that we've already got. We've got EAP, we've got these training programs, we've got um, these policies around bullying and harassment, respectful behaviours, you know, our code of conduct, that sort of thing. Um, however, does that fundamentally change the experience of work by that frontline worker? Um, and in most cases, that doesn't actually trickle down to any perceivable change. So what we really need to see again is that we're getting closer to that frontline worker, which the leader, if we're able to train them on what does good work look like and how can you actually take control over work design, um, should actually have a much closer um, uh, link to that frontline worker and hopefully create more of a perceivable impact on their experience of work. Uh, as we saw as well, people who have started to broach the, the topic of psychosocial hazards with uh, frontline leaders um, are really focusing on just awareness raising at the moment rather than skill building. And that's why I've always been reluctant to, you know, create a Flourish DX training program on um, psychosocial hazard awareness. I don't think, again, that really fundamentally changes the experience of work for workers. Leaders actually need to understand not just what does have the potential to cause harm, but what is their ability to actually change those things and make work, first of all, safer, but also wellbeing promoting uh, for their workers. Um, and the only way to do that is to get out of the classroom and get them to practice some of these skills rather than purely doing something either online or, or in a classroom environment and building awareness of these things. Uh, and the other issue that we wanted to address through this training uh, program that we've crafted is that when we're talking about people leaders, it's hard often to get them all in the room at uh, a room at the same time and, and do training and skill development with them. Um, so we wanted something that was quite um, uh, easy for, you know, just maybe several leaders to go on at the same time or, you know, even be able to participate in that training on demand um, without necessarily, um, you know, having to uh, attend it live uh, all the time if they're, for whatever reason, are called away. Because we said all the time, right, we put on training for leaders and then something more important comes up and they don't turn up to training. So how is it that we can actually get this across to all leaders uh, without either having to put on big group training or um, 
you know, people missing out on the training because of other things coming up in their work. So lots of issues that we, we wanted to address. Um, and I think, I think uh, we have um, come up with a solution that actually is going to suit um, or, or deal with a lot of those challenges that we've brought up. Uh, I'm not sure, Joelle, if there's anything else that was um, top of mind for you that um, I haven't covered yet, noting that you had nothing to do with developing this PowerPoint today. Um, thanks, Jason. Um, I suppose um, one of the concerns that we hear quite often from leaders as well is that they don't understand what their role is in managing psych hazards and they hear people talking about sort of the leader's role in mental health for their employees or their um, their direct reports and they, yeah, they, they don't know what that means. They get concerned that they're going to be expected to be counsellors or psychologists or, or something like that. Um, and when we have those um, those one-on-one -on -one conversations with leaders and explain what this actually means for them in their role um, and sort of frame it in managing the aspects of work that have the potential to cause harm to their direct reports, they really understand what that looks like for them in that context. So, um, yeah, I think it's um, the, the conversations that we've had definitely have um, shown us that there is that need for helping leaders to understand what that what this means for them in their role and then what from a practical perspective can they do yeah it's a good point and it kind of brings me back to when we had tony lamontagna on on the podcast and that was something that really stood out for me i think we, we might have even made a small clip of, of him talking about that when talking to leaders around um you know mental health in the workplace you know that they do have this fear that they're being asked to be a psychologist or a counsellor. We're even seeing that within the health and safety profession with the, the push out of psychosocial risk regulations that they're like, hey, we're not a psychologist. We're not dealt, we're not designed or um, equipped to be able to deal with this. Um, but when you explain to people, well, actually, just by crafting better work, you can have actually quite a significant mental health impact on people. And all we're asking you to do is to make work suck a little less and try and design it with a bit more thought in mind for people's well-being rather than just driving business outcomes. And it, uh, I remember Tony saying, you know, when he talks to leaders about that, you know, they get this wave of relief going, oh, I don't need to be a psychologist. I just need to do what I've been employed to do, and that is to manage a team and to make sure that the um, the environment of work is facilitating, um, you know, better outcomes. And I'm getting rid of some of these, these hindrance demands and, and, and thinking more around um, more sustainable team performance rather than just driving people uh, with a whip. Hi listeners, Jason here. We hope you're enjoying this latest podcast episode. Now, if you're like Joelle, Alicia and myself and enjoy learning from the best, then the Flourish DX Academy is for you. The Academy includes free e-learning courses on the ISO 45003 standard for psychological health and safety at work and associated topics such as how to conduct a psychosocial risk assessment and how to create the business case for psych health and safety. All courses feature high quality videos, downloadable resources, multi-choice questions, and a downloadable training certificate on completion. Take your learning to the next level with all Flourish DX Academy courses included within the Flourish DX mobile app. Select podcast episodes from the Psych Health and Safety podcast and sister podcasts from Canada and the USA are also included. Get started with Flourish DX for free at www.flourishdx.com forward slash get hyphen started. That's www.flourishdx.com forward slash get hyphen started. Now back to this episode. Alicia, you wanted to uh, contribute. Yeah, I was just going to add, um, there's been just in my um, experiences, you know, um, undertaking some of this type of training, some of the hesitation is around, you know, this is just something additional that leaders have to do. Um, you know, it's it's more work to add to their workload as well. Um, but rather than adding more work, it's more about um, how they can um, just implement some things as simple as, you know, when they're having because good good people leadership usually involves, you know, having um, check-ins with your staff, one-on-one um, -on -one check-ins at least, you know, once a once a fortnight, once once a month is um, what we hear, um, and we say, you know, if you can make it once a fortnight, even better. Um, but even at, even at that cadence, once a month, even having you know check-ins with your staff, but incorporating some of this type of 
um, exploration around um, not just um, how are you going, make it more explicit around, you know, what's your experience of work, what's working well, what's not working well, um, so that so that some of these hazards or work factors can be addressed in those um, regular catch-ups and then for the managers to think about how they can respond to that, what, what's in their control to change um, to make work better for, for, for their team members. Yeah, like you say, it's it's not about adding extra work. It's just giving them some skills that, that every leader should have um, to understand around what does sustainable team performance look like. Uh, yes, we want engagement, we want productivity, but is it sustainable or are we burning people out, right? Because we aren't actually dealing with the experience of work. Um, so uh, we're going to bring, bring up Dia's question a little bit later on. Looks like there's a few people who are already contributing. We love Dia. She might want to take herself off um, mute in a, in, a, in a moment later um, and contribute as well. Um, we're not asking leaders to do anything different. We're going, well, you can get the same outcomes and possibly even a better outcome if you actually understand a little bit about work design and your role as a leader and actually consulting with workers about what's working and what's not. Cool, so with that in mind, um, what does the training look like? So what we've decided to do is um, have two uh, virtual seminars. Um, the first one is really introducing um, leaders to some key concepts. Um, uh, so what is work design? Um, so I think to Dee's point, you know, some people leaders, for example, would have no idea what that actually means. Uh, and what is psychological health and safety? So how do we apply that risk-based lens? And what is, you know, the regulation changes in Australia and how does that actually apply um, to their role um, in creating psychologically healthy teams? Um, but we we don't want to just give people the, um, the theory. We want them to think about their practice. So we're going to be giving them some skill building around how do you consult with your teams regarding you know, again, what Alicia was saying, what's working well, what's not. Um, and so we'll be providing some tools, which I'll, I'll talk to in a moment, um, to be able to assist with some practice of that consultation um, following that first live lecture. Um, then we want them to think about in the next live lecture, how do we improve the design of work? And we're really focusing on key theories like um, job demands, resources, so social determination theory, uh, challenge and hindrance demands, going, all right, well, how, how do we actually create um, less demands and, and add resources where possible. Uh, and how do we consult with the team members to, to create contextually specific actions that are going to address uh, the design of work? Um, and then what they'll have to do following that second um, module is, is to actually go away and create an action plan and submit that as their final assignment for the course. So we want to see um, throughout the course, not just them understanding the theory, which will be assessed through some quizzes, but we also want them to be able to um, demonstrate that they're actually doing some of the skill building by consulting with their team, identifying the job demands and resources that are in place, and then creating an action plan to deal with some of the key demands and, and looking at how they can add resources. Um, we will be having live lectures that will be timed at around about midday, uh, Australian Eastern time um, in December and January. Um, and, uh, but, for those people who can't attend live, it, all of the sessions will be recorded and they will have six months access to those, those lectures um, following uh, those going live as well. And once our leaders have finished uh, all the requirements, so a couple of quizzes and the two practical activities, then they'll be given a certificate um, of completion for the course. So again, what we're trying to do is to move away from, you know, just doing the the theory building, um, and then uh, also looking at what is the practice um, that they can go away and, and uh, start to build some competence in. So specifically in, in module one, um, we'll be building foundational awareness and knowledge of work design, psychological health and safety. So we're talking about the role of good work in protecting and promoter, promoting team member wellbeing. Uh, we'll talk to those legal requirements in Australia relating to workplace health and safety regulations, but also the positive duty under the amendment to the Sexual Discrimination Act. Uh, so that's something that, um, uh, you know, is, is pretty big. Uh, Joel was our subject matter expert uh, on a webinar that we delivered recently on that, that was very well attended. Um, so thinking about also how do we apply that health and safety lens, not just to um, uh, psychosocial hazards, uh, like work design factors, but also uh, unsafe behaviours like um, bullying and sexual harassment. Uh, we'll talk about the risk management framework uh, and the practical application of this. 
And then, like I said, we want to do some um, of those next steps around how do you then consult with team members to identify work design issues and prioritise action areas. Now, the tool with, uh, with the course will also give leaders access to some of our tools. So the tool that they can use uh, to consult with workers uh, is our wellbeing checking. Uh, there is a QR code if anyone wants to check out what that looks like. But essentially, it's a, it's a one minute uh, assessment, which gets people to reflect on how they feel. And that ranges from angry and stressed up to happy and joyful. Um, and then they're asked to reflect on why do you feel that way? So it's a selection, first of all, of individual factors, which might be some home circumstances that are leading to them feeling a certain way. But we really want them to focus on the work factors. So if they're feeling positive, why is that? You know, what is it about work that is making you feel positive? And that's a great way to identify job resources. But also when you're not feeling well, what are the, the, the demands of work um, that are having an impact? So again, that's a way of identifying those psychosocial hazards. So um, that's a, a really um, easy to use tool and an easy to interpret tool that was just a little bit of instruction through our course that leaders can, can use to, um, to take some of those invisible psychosocial hazards and make them visible so they're able to have more pointed conversations with their team about what's working and what's not. So that's module one uh, and the practical activity associated with module one. Uh, module two, uh, now it's about, again, creating an action plan, okay, uh, to prior, like, uh, dealing with the priorities identified from that initial consultation. Hmm. So um, we're going to be covering um, key psychological, con uh, psychological concepts, again, including job demands and resources and self-determination theory. Uh, we'll talk about work design changes that can be made at a team level, not just at an org level, um, specifically focusing on the remit of the leader to reduce job demands and add job resources. Uh, we're going to talk also about the concept of job crafting and how to consult with individual team members to improve person job fit. So not only do we think that we can help leaders to design work that is good for the many uh, within their team, but also we know that sometimes individual accommodations are going to need to be made for um, the frontline workers. So, you know, how can they support those individual accommodations on a case-by-case -case basis through job crafting? Um, and then we don't expect leaders to be the font of all knowledge regarding work design uh, or psychosocial risk management. So, um, you know, when, how and from whom can they seek support for um, issues that have been identified through cons consult uh, consultation with their team that might need support from other areas of the business to create any meaningful difference in the experience of work for their team. Following that, the activity will be to use, um, or we will make available our action planning tool uh, which actually takes uh, leaders through step by step. All right, now that you've identified a particular work design factor, um, how or what controls or actions are you going to put in place to address that? So within the action planning feature within Flourish DX, that they really are guided to think around okay, what um, is a control that might work within our particular environment? What does that look like? They're actually given some prompts. Um, who's going to be responsible for that? When are we going to be able to complete the spy? And even getting them to think about where does this sit on the hierarchy of controls? Is this something that we're talking around that is an elim elimination strategy or a work redesign strategy? Um, or is it, you know, maybe bottom uh, bottom of the, uh, the the triangle, which is more focused on the individual and maybe self-care? So really getting them to think about, you know, what's a more effective or likely to be a more effective way uh, of addressing some of the key things that we've identified through our team member consultation. Uh, the instructors, you really have an all-star team of instructors on the course. So I'll be taking the lead again, as I do with the professional practice program. Uh, and then we'll have um, uh, ably support, uh, we'll be ably supported by Joelle, Felicia and Heather. And uh, as Andrew does on our professional practice program, no doubt he'll be jumping in as well. Uh, he's actually been called up last minute. I don't know if he even knows yet to do something for the professional practice uh, program this evening. So he's great at a pinch. Um, as I mentioned, um, the people who participate in the course will get access to all the content for six months um, from the beginning of the course. Um, so that's all the live lectures. There's always bonus resources and quizzes and, and other things as well that, that will be added in. Um, so we have that available through the Flourish DX Academy like we do with our professional practice program uh, as well. So you're probably all wondering what the price is. Um, we have early bird pricing that opens up today. Uh, so it's $698 per person for the whole course. So that's uh, obviously the uh, two live lectures plus the practical activities and the tools that we'll provide for that. 
Uh, the regular pricing, which will kick in from uh, within a month, uh, is $798. But we also have a 10% discount on either the early bird or the regular pricing um, if you have four or more leaders that you want to sign up to the program. Uh, the program uh, commences 5th of December um, with the second lecture being on the 17th of January. So ordinarily, because we will be running it again next year at some point, so ordinarily there'd be four, four weeks between Module 1 and Module 2, but because of the Christmas break and, and people taking time off, we've uh, just uh, given a bigger break between um, Module 1 and Module 2. So 5th of December and 17th of January are the two live lectures for the first cohort going through. Uh, we will be taking up to 100 people on this first cohort as well. Uh, and we've got pretty much two months uh, before we kick that one off. So I think that brings us to the end of what I wanted to present. Um, Joelle, was there anything else you wanted to, um, to mention? Uh, no, I don't think so. Um, <clears throat> so Dia's just added a, she, she's made a comment rather than a question um, talking about what she's been doing. Um, Siobhan's just asked her, what is the, how frequently do we plan to run these courses? Uh, depends on demand, right? So this is our first time offering a course like this. So um, we'll see what the demand is and then we'll weigh it up. So similar to our professional practice course, um, we've decided the next one will start in February next year. We were undecided about whether we'd run a second cohort starting before Christmas. But again, we didn't sell out the first cohort. We only had 50 people um, attend that one, which is pretty good given when you had a month's notice that we gave people for that one. Um, so we'll, we'll see um, how many people take this one up. But if there's a lot of demand, then we'll put them on more frequently in the new year. Um, Dia, did you want to unmute yourself and just chat through or, or explain to us a little bit more about um, what you've done with your internal training? Hi, Joelle. Um, Hi. Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, I've been doing some work around workload management in particular and uh, embedding, embedding a lot of uh, work design into the kind of strategies we have but I haven't called it out as work design because, as I said, a few years ago, one of our clients really wanted to be proactive and they wanted to do roll out work design training across their leaders. And we got very little uptake when we advertised the program because leaders A saw it as health and safety and they saw it as uh, not really leadership stuff. Whereas, you know, when you go into work design, it's actually core leadership behaviors that you're looking for. Um, so we rebadged it as uh, setting up your people for success, which attracted a lot more people and people got excited about it and they, it was heavily oversubscribed at that time. So I think there is an opportunity for us as practitioners to think about how we position it. So while it is core health and safety and, and fundamental, maybe the way to attract leaders and get their buy-in is to position it more from that leadership lens, they'd be interested in your thoughts on that. Thanks, Dia. So um, it's as much, if not more, about marketing than it is about content sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and, and I agree, uh, Dia. And I've been playing around uh, um, with some terminology that might resonate a bit better. Uh, in fact, I've already gone ahead and bought the domain name Sustainable Team right. Performance. <laughs> <laughs> It wasn't um, one I was thinking about. Uh, you're thinking about something else, yeah. So I, um, oh dear, I know dear likes my um, my cream uh, acronym uh, for what does good work design look like. Joelle hates me using that acronym. Um, but Not just Joelle. I, I think Andrew loves it. Look at him. Um, so <laughs> Alicia's giving you a thumbs down. But it's it's really about understanding. Hey, we don't need to sacrifice worker well being to get good yeah. results. Yeah. And if we think about worker well-being in a sustainable sense, like how do we actually get rid of these hindrance demands, for example, um, use challenge demands strategically to increase motivation, but not on the, all the time, that will lead to mm. burnout. Um, we can get really good performance, but also good well-being, which leads to more sustainability in terms of our human resources, rather than burning them out and then them either like leaving uh, the organisation or developing a psychological injury. Um, so that's how I really want to um, frame it. Absolutely. Um, all right, we've got a question from Therese. Will this be offered to individual client organisations in the future or only as a public course? 
Uh, yeah, so we've already had some um, people reach out since we've started to promote it uh, for internal use. And yes, we will be offering it as an internal course as well for companies that want to do that. So just to reach out to uh, myself um, directly uh, or um, support at flourishdx.com and uh, we'll, we'll be able to respond to that if there is interest in running it internally in your organisation. Um, we obviously understand that it can be hard. Like I mentioned, one of the obstacles for leader training is sometimes it's hard to get uh, enough leaders together to make it meaningful uh, to engage a psychologist to run that. So um, we, yeah, we, we figured we'd launch with a public offering where you know you can put as little as one leader on at a time uh, for them to get the benefit. All right, and uh, we've got a question from Izzy. Um, I guess building on um, what Dia um, was talking about. So she's saying that um, leaders struggle with the concept that job resources in the context of the JDR model does not necessarily equal having more people available. Um, so do we have any thoughts on how to market that term differently? Yeah, and I think, um, yeah, this is, again, something that we have to do regarding um, language usage. Um, yeah. But I also want... I want leaders to be thinking about demands as well. I think too often we are talking about resources. And then when we talk about resources, I think about benefits as well, right? Yeah, like yeah. Pizza, pizza parties and um, like yoga and gym memberships and that sort of thing, rather than going, well, actually, what are things like autonomy or levels of support that we can give to people yeah. or um, that sort of thing? So, Jason, just yeah. if it helps, because I often use an example. When, when I'm talking about workload, because again, people think of a workload as amount of work, not that job demands resources. And, and again, they're not sure of what resources mean. So if you give people a worked out example, and I share one which uh, resonates for me, which was my first experience of doing procurement in the public sector, <laughs> and the yeah. number of challenges that I had doing that where I had to redo things, I got the wrong information, didn't get enough feedback. And by the end of it, by the end of the week, I was like in tears, in frustration. And I said, okay, let's unpack what happened there. It wasn't the amount of work, what else was it? And then that's how I get people to understand all these little factors that we can control. And that is within our up within our scope and our remit to influence and that's a really good way of getting leaders up front to start oh yeah okay I, I see what you mean there's always things that we can tweak and we can manage it's about the experience someone has doing the work yeah 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 so uh, and again you know I think it's good to use the terminology that already exists and it's mm. good to educate leaders on this. But like you say, to use examples and to reframe um, to make sure that they completely understand what we're talking about. Um, yeah. And that's why we've got, you know, two two-hour sessions to make sure that we are able to articulate that well and it does sink in uh, versus like a one-hour lunch and learn or something. Cool. Thanks for the question, Izzy. Uh, all right. Well, I think that uh, unless anyone else has any final questions, um, I think that is uh, it for today. Um, I will be sharing out the PowerPoint um, following this. The website now for the leader training is now live. Um, so there is a link by the QR code here. But also you'll receive it uh, in an email later today um, if you'd like to check out the course. And there's a flyer as well. And uh, feel free to pass on to your colleagues um, and peers uh, at work as well. Uh, but thank you all for, for coming along today. We're really excited, as you can probably tell, uh, about launching this, this new program in the next couple of months. Uh, and we look forward to seeing some of your leaders on the course soon as well. All right, so thanks, everyone. You've been listening to the Psych Health and Safety Podcast. To stay up to date with the latest on psychological injury prevention, follow Flourish DX on LinkedIn and subscribe to the Psych Health and Safety Podcast at www.psychhealthandsafety.com.